All right. If you guys want to go ahead and find a seat and get your Bibles out, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. The title of today's message is Working in God's Field, in His Building, and His Temple. We'll kind of see those three uh, areas through the text. And I just, before I even get in, I just, my heart's overwhelming with just praising the Lord. Um, You guys know that God is moving in people's lives here at this church just so wonderful. Um, I'm sure he's moving in your life, and uh, we were at a wedding last night, and just talking to somebody from the church, and um, getting to know them, didn't really know them very well, and they just talked about how uh, God brought them to this church. They were not Christians. They weren't walking with God. They got invited, and uh, the message was directly to them and for them, and they drove home looking at each other like, like God God's getting a hold of us. God wants us. And they've just been living for him and radical transformation in coming out of some of the darkest places that you can imagine. And it was so crazy to hear because I didn't even remember teaching the message they were talking about, you know, and they're like, oh, it's about two years ago or so. And I'm like, boy, I don't even remember that. And and Lindsay and I were just, you know, boy, for us, this is kind of work for me. I love it. You know, they say, have a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life, you know. Um, So it's but you know, I, I've got time crunches that I got to get here. I got to get screens up on the thing. I got to get over here. I got to get this, you know, I got a time. We got to get done by donut festival. We got Then the next thing, and then you guys are out and I'm out. And, you know, it's like repeat, you know, rinse and repeat or whatever. And, and, uh, and I don't even know about so many of these stories. And we were just like, man, the Lord is, he's moving. And it's not about me. You know, it's not about even the church itself, but God is moving through his church. And, um, and it kind of just goes with what he's doing in his field or in the building that he's building in us and in the sanctuary that he's dwelling in in our hearts. He's changing lives. And so uh, we get to be a part of that as we're working uh, for God's field for God's building and for God's temple. Now, the main idea of today is that God uses his servants to build the church and he'll judge the quality of each person's work. But it's him that's responsible for the church's growth. Now, remember, the Corinthians were a church that were in trouble. First Corinthians is essentially a big wooden paddle to the behind of the Corinthians, right? Uh, They had allowed politics to infiltrate the church. And as a result, they were acting, much as we see in our country today, as rival political parties, uh, more than as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so last week we saw that the Corinthian people were acting like babies. They were immature. They were unable to grow and to digest the meat of the word and doctrine and theology. They were still babies because they were still carnal. They were acting worldly. They were acting fleshly. And one of the evidences of their carnality was that they were politicizing within the church who their favorite pastor was, who their favorite preacher was, what their favorite denomination was. And it was all external and temporary. And the Lord wanted to do a work uh, with giving them kingdom vision for what he does among his people. So uh, these three areas, God's field, God's building, God's temple. Let's start with God's field. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 3. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave each one. So uh, there were factions, there were political parties, there were cliques and favorites among who the best leaders were within this church. And Paul even writes himself, who am I? Who's Paul? I'm nothing. 
And who's Apollos? Remember from Acts chapter 18, Apollos was a very eloquent man, very knowledgeable. Um, Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and taught him the ways of God more accurately, and then he was used so powerfully in the planting of churches. Um, So he was a, a famous preacher, probably had a YouTube channel, you know, um, probably had a really active X account, an Instagram account. And, you know, uh, those are typically the popular ones that have those sorts of technological avenues. And so, but he's like, you know, who am I and who is, uh, you know, Apollos, but ministers. We're just ministers, Now, to you, you're like, well, yeah, duh, you're a minister, so obviously you're a big deal. You probably have a black jacket with a white clerical collar, the shape of a square, you know, and and you're like the big deal as a minister. But what minister speaks of is not anybody in any elevated position, but rather a servant. Okay, now, I happen to be up on a platform right now so that you can see and hear me when I talk. But if I could get any lower and wash your feet to show you I'm not better than you, I want to be your servant and lay my life down for you to know Jesus and to be cared for by him. I'm just a servant. And Paul says, that's what I am. I'm a deacon. A diakonos is the word. And diakonos speaks of an under rower, somebody that in those big old time ships that wasn't up on the giant, you know, steering wheel thing, yo, ho, yo. You know, uh, but they were downstairs. They were in the galley, you know. They were down in the thing that was just like, we'll never be seen. And all we do is this continual motion and provide muscle manpower. But they were super important to the mobility of that ship and the movement of that ship. It wouldn't be able to operate without them. Serving in obscurity and providing the muscle to make things move. And Paul says, that's what we are. We're we're nothing but servants. The Lord is the glorious one. And he says, we're just servants through whom you believed. And the Lord has given each of us a role in that. Or the New Living Translation says, a work in that. Now, you might underline in the verse that they are those through whom you've believed, not on whom you believed. If there's any pastor that you've believed on or you've elevated to a platform that you're just starry-eyed when you hear him and think about him and just, that's just, they are it. I'm just telling you right now, the best men are men at best and they are going to fail you. And I'd say all the time, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. You're going to be disappointed in me. And so tragically, many men that are in places of prominence, they fall in really bad ways. And uh, and it causes people to no longer believe in the Lord because it's as if the Lord failed them. And you just need to know, we're just the servants through whom you believe. Look past us and look at the one that we're pointing you to. Uh, Vaughn and Lee put it, Paul notes the essential unity between the planter and waterer. They are one in the aim, result, and motivating power of their work. They are allies, not rivals. And so Paul and Apollos didn't want there to be any factions. They wanted there to be unity. We're all in this together. Just servants. And Alexander McLaren says, so what is the use of fighting which of two nothings was the greater? <laughs> we're just servants. We're just nothing. Well, we're going to fight about which one, you know. Uh, yeah, don't fight about it. Let's keep the main focus on Jesus. Charles Hodge says, the doctrines that they preach are not their own discoveries, and the power that makes their preaching successful is not in them. They are nothing, and therefore it is an entire perversion of their relationship to the church to make them party leaders. So it's hopefully convicting to you, those big names that you follow that are the bee's knees, man, like take them out at the knees, you know. Um, Don't elevate them in your heart to be something more than the Lord would have them be. Uh, We don't want to create these factions and party leaders within the church. And so Paul continues uh, speaking concerning the field. I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
And so in ministry, it's a, a farm is a great picture of this. One man does the work of planting seeds. Oftentimes that's kind of the initial church planting or evangelical movement within a community, the missionary team, the one that pulls up stakes to move to that area to start the prayer meeting and works another job and, uh, you know, gets that home group Bible study going as an initial Bible study within that church. And they were the planters. They prepared the ground, you know, they, they got things going and maybe even stayed there for their entire life in that ministry. But they were the planters. But then other ministers come along in support of that and help tend the ground and tend the crop and water and bring the word of God, and bring the fertilizer and the nutrients just through ministry. And, uh, and that is all an important part of the farm. Charles Hodge says, as the farmer's work is the ordinary and appointed means of securing a harvest, so the work of the ministry is the ordinary means of conversion. So each one of us, and I'm going to get into it, that yes, you are a part of it. Uh, we have a part in this what seems so ordinary. I mean, I don't even feel, I'm just, I showed up on a Friday and I got the bathrooms cleaned for Sunday, you know, and it's like, you're a part of it. It's all a part of it. It seems like such a, an obscure task that's disconnected from maybe what's happening right here or something as the word of God goes forth into the hearts. Uh, but it's just as much a part of it. And, you know, if you've ever worked on a farm, and you, of course, could apply this probably to any trade, but, you know, the, the watering crew may seem like, you know, I think of the McKinnon boys over here, you know, they're at that age where it's like strong young bucks with good backs waking up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, get out there in the field while it's still frosty and move that hand line all around the field. And to them, they probably feel like, I'm just such an unimportant part of the farm. A lot of times when we're the irrigation crew, it's like, Man, you know, I'm just, I'm just moving pipe and moving pipe and priming pumps and getting the pump going and all of those things and changing sprinklers. And, you know, there's the guy over there that's in the big tractor and has got the forklift and driving the semi with the hay and shipping it off to market. And those are the important guys. But guess what? None of that would happen if there wasn't the guys with the strong backs out there moving the hand line early in the morning. And so each one of us in the church, we've got a different role. Some appears to be more glamorous, but Paul says, don't get there in your mind. We would not function without everybody doing the planting, the watering, and, and all the other roles that are involved in that. Uh, and, and then at the end of the day, God is the one that causes the growth. It's God that gives the increase, it says there uh, as well. So, I did one aspect of the work, Paul says, Apollos did another, but it was the Lord who made it all healthy. It was the Lord who made it all fruitful. Paul establishes a church, Apollos nurtures that church, but all the growth came from God. I remember hearing years ago the story of an African missionary who spent his whole life ministering to a tribe and never saw a single convert. And he died, and they buried him in the ground, and immediately another missionary came to take his place, and the whole entire tribe got saved. <laughs> you know, and no doubt, like his whole life, he's like, this, I just the Lord called me here. I'm just being faithful. I know he's going to do something someday. And as he's dying, he's like, maybe he's not, you know? <laughs> You know, and then the punk shows up, probably in a new jet airliner or something, you know, got the newest, latest, you know, trekking gear, or bush gear for Africa, got the big hard hat, you know, thing, Africa hard hat, you know, and just walks in there and just, you know, does a drama with mimery and the whole entire place erupts and explodes and gets saved. That's often the case of how it happens. But it wasn't the first guy and it wasn't the second guy. It was the Lord that brought the increase. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful 
but the workers are few or the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so the same is true today in Prineville. There are so many people that the Lord wants to bring to him. And in his great design, he hasn't left it just up to himself. He uses us to be a part of that. And so interesting, he says, hey, look at the, all the unsaved around you. And he says, pray, number one, and ask the Lord to use the people to go out and, and preach the gospel. So he's the Lord of the harvest. He's also the one that sends us out into the harvest. And so maybe include that in your morning prayers this week. Lord of the harvest, send me out today into your harvest and, and let's reap, Lord. Let's reap souls for your kingdom. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. There are so many people that just go through life ministering and they don't know if they've ever really seen much good from it. You've got to trust the Lord who's bringing it in his own good due time. So, I planted, Apollos watered, the Lord gives the increase. Verse 7 says, <clears throat> so then, neither he who plants is anything, nor is he who waters, but God gives the increase. You know, neither one of the crew is the main factor in the equation, but it's that Lord who gives the increase. Those who establish or strengthen churches are not denigrated. They have an important Paul, but Paul, uh, as you know, Paul's not dismissing their labor. Uh, but the issue here is we need to understand the source of growth. Andrew Wilson said, putting too much stock by human leaders shows a misunderstanding of where the growth really comes from. And so, you know, there may be some application in this on, you know, days that I'm not filling the pulpit or days that I'm not at the Pulse prayer meeting. Last night I was at a wedding and yet the Pulse still happened and it's, well, if Rory's not the one leading the prayer meeting, or if Chris or, you know, whoever's not. And it's like, boy, when the people get together to pray, the Lord meets. And that's where the power is. It's not in the person or the personality. And so we don't want to have a misunderstanding anymore of where growth uh, actually comes from. The man at the front end and the man at the back end of the ministry are just servants. It's the Lord who accomplishes the work. David Guzik said, when a farmer plants a seed and waters it, he really does not make it grow. The miracle of life does that. All the farmer can do is provide the right environment for growth and trust in the miracle of life. We do the same thing in ministering to other people. Verse 8, now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So the Lord is not unjust. In fact, I've had the verse here, Hebrews 6.10. It always comes to my mind. Um, the Lord is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you've shown towards his name, and that you've ministered to the saints, and you do minister so just an encouragement to you, if you're serving here, you know, you're in children's ministry, or you've got a men's group, or you've had a home group in your home, or you've been discipling people, and you just, the weeks go by, and sometimes you see growth. Man, there was a period where, um, you know, we would host home groups in our home, and just to me, that's like, is there any more of a way that I could just pour my, open my heart up to you? and have you into my home, like where I'm cruise around in my underwear sometimes, you know, not in my underwear when you come over, but you know, like this is my home, right? Uh, you know, this is like, this is how we are. I'm being vulnerable by showing you're going to see stuff unfinished and a dirty refrigerator, you know, and maybe I didn't vacuum in the corner like I should have, you know, or whatever, you know, and, and, I'm, and I would open myself up. And we would have core groups at our home as well. Men's one morning. Lindsay would have women in our home. And you know, there was a season where almost every person that was in any one of those groups has left the church. I mean, maybe that speaks to something. Like, well, did you ever notice that you're a weirdo? I mean, uh, there's a truth, you know. 
It was just, it was grievous, you know? It wasn't because of any moral failure on our end or anything like that. It was just like, boy, like, honestly, we were betrayed by many people in different ways. And, uh, you know, and so there's these times where we're just like, man, does the Lord even know that we are trying to do Acts 242 through 47 here in our home, in our church, in our life? You know, where is the Lord? And I just remember my sister, Heather, speaking to me. Hey, remember Hebrews says, the Lord is not unjust. He won't forget the labor that you've been pouring in and that you have ministered to the saints in different ways and that you do minister to the saints in different ways. You got to trust the Lord in that. So serving in children's ministry, serving in all these different ways that you do, sometimes in obscurity, cleaning the toilets, taking out the garbage, mopping the floor, all the things that need to, you know, think of the yard and the weeding and all of that stuff. He sees it. There's a reward for it. We'll see the reward in just a little bit. D.A. Carson says, to heap unqualified and exclusive praise on the sower is to focus too narrowly. To praise those who handle the irrigation and forget those who sow the seed is to be myopic. In any case, it is God alone who makes things grow. Should not he be praised? And man, if we can just be so quick to be mirrors that reflect praise. You know, I I get some praise every now and then. Oh, that was a great message. I just did a wedding and I feel like my weddings, I really preach the gospel and I show Jesus in marriage and all that. And, uh, you know, and I get a lot of accolades at weddings and funerals because people don't really hear the gospel a whole lot at places. And, And I just, as quick as I can, I just reflect it to the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that he's shown me the gospel so that now I can show you the gospel. Or he's worked a miracle in my marriage and in my life, in my home. Now I can help you with that. And just as much as we can be mirrors that reflect his glory, Now, we want to give him praise when people are thanking you for the different great ways that you're serving within the church. So, the first aspect of this text was that we are working for his field or in his field. Then he switches from an agricultural image to an architectural image from verses 9 through 15. From agriculture to construction, from husbandry to carpentry. His building. Look at verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. So, you are God's field. We established that. You are also God's building. Speaking of a church, so Calvary Prineville, you're also God's building. Uh, We're going to get to, as individuals, in just a little bit, how we're all part of the grander temple of the Lord, and we are the sanctuary. As people, 1 Peter 2, 5, we are living stones that are being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So not only is there a picture of us being a flock as Christians, and we're each a sheep, you know, in that, you know, or we are branches in the vineyard connected to the vine, Uh, but we are also part of the house of God, and each one of us are these living stones in the temple, and we are singing stones. Remember how Jesus said, even the rocks will cry out? We actually, as each individual, we get to be a part of the worship that helps in the building of the house. Um, And so, verse 10, it says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. So uh, God graciously gave him this task as a, you you almost hear Paul toot his own horn just a little bit, as a wise master builder, right? Uh, He's like, I'm good at what I do, you know, Uh, but uh, he's skilled, right? Uh, As this master builder. Now in the Greek, the word that's used here is architecton. I just wonder what word we get uh, from this master builder, right? Of course, architect. Uh, You'll be encouraged to know that we're working on some ideas still with the building expansion project. Perry's been working and waiting, and we've got a couple different architectural firms 
we, we've basically given them what we do as a church and what we have and are asking their advice of what they would do as wise master builders with what we have. And so we're getting a meeting scheduled within the next week or two to meet with two different firms who are going to help, help walk us through it. So we've got some grand vision and grand ideas of where we think the Lord is leading. You guys know how that goes. So it's like the Lord has often pushed pause for us. Um, but it is exciting to work with the wise, skilled master builders. Um, I can't remember which book I read. I po- pasted it in here with no uh, attribution. But it said this phrase, expert builder, is often used to speak of craftsmen. I don't know if craftsman is a good product, you know. Um, I feel like every time I've used a wrench craftsman, it's broken or something. Or, or, you know, for Christmas, I got you this craftsman drill. And you're like... the wrong color of red. I wanted a Milwaukee. But anyways, um, no, I'm joking. But you know, but I have thought, I go into Ace, you know, and I see Craftsman, and I'm kind of like, you know, they did a good job branding it. They get it for whatever else. Good job on the Craftsman, you know, and I go and I buy something Craftsman, and the guy at the counter typically was Russ back in the day. He's like, are you sure you're worthy of such a named product here? You know, uh, so a, a Craftsman, Just as a contractor uses the skill to make a building look magnificent, so does Paul as an expert builder. Look at the blueprint of the master architect. God's design, the building codes, he uses tact and insight, wise, clever expertise in how to build a ministry. So that's essentially what Paul has done as a minister, a master builder. He laid the foundation He laid it, kind of that church planter ministry. Someone else comes along. And remember in the agriculture, it was waters. But instead here, we're talking architectural. And so someone else builds upon the foundation, right? Uh, Upon the the concrete, right? And then he says uh, a warning here to be careful. There's general admonition on how to build on this foundation. Let Each one take heed how he build on it. Work as that craftsman with excellence and integrity. Guys, I am Mr. DIY. Watch a quick YouTube video and start nailing things together. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Watch the video. And I built a lot of my home. I've built like half of finishing half my home. And uh, it's not real great. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I loathe the day when we sell this place and find out all the things that we need to do to make it habitable for a regular human being. I'm starting to realize why people left the church after coming into my home. But, uh, <clears throat> you, know, uh, you know, just about a year and a half ago or so, Chris was helping me put windows in, new windows. And so uh, he kind of line me out, you know, and go, and I'd do a lot of it, and then we'd come back and be like, oh, man, we didn't offset these right. We're going to have to take them all out and redo this, but Chris goes, hey, anything that's worth doing is worth doing twice. Am I right? You know, (laughs) I'm like, I think so. You know, just encouraging me, right? And so, you know, I'm not the guy to really speak with great authority on this, except that I can tell when things are wrong, and I don't have the time, money, or energy to fix it. So... I think Jesus will still come back whether or not the sheetrock is flush all across the wall. Anyways, um, you can tell what I'm working on right now. So we work with excellence in our ministry with integrity. We work with good motives, good methods, good goals. We're regularly assessing what's the Lord doing in our church at any given time. Just like we've had to recently, the Lord's moving towards this midweek gathering, just doing something different right now for this season because of what is going on in life. How we work for and in the church matters. You might put how. And why we work in and for the church matters. You might note why. How and why. Motives, methods, goals with excellence and integrity. Look at verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So very important, Christians, very important, church, 
There's only one foundation in the building of the church, and it's Jesus Christ. All right? He is the root. He is the source. If a community is not established on the basis of the gospel, the community is not a church at all. It's not a church. It's a fraud. And the only true basis for the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isaiah speaks towards it uh, that I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. And Peter in the book of Acts will bring this up again, that Jesus was and is that chief cornerstone. Ephesians tells us in 2.20 that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being that chief cornerstone. And so uh, when you're assessing the various churches in a community, look at the foundation, okay? Uh, Look for cracks in the foundation. When there's a red flag that comes up, your spidey senses are probably tingling because there is an unsure foundation in that church, in that ministry, in that religion. And if it's not based in the gospel, then, uh, then it's, it's wrong. And, you know, my kids are in the public school right now. We have a lot of friendships with Mormons. And uh, Russell's just been preaching the gospel to a lot of Mormon kids. Um, kids have come to Jesus uh, you remember, I just was going through baptism pictures for our new website. Remember Ian, who's our kid's friend that comes to the church? He was saved out of a Mormon background. Last week on the way home from a soccer game on Saturday, Russell led a kid to Jesus on the bus uh, who was like, man, I have a Mormon background. I read the Book of Mormon. It doesn't sit right with me. What's the difference between Christianity and Mormonism? Russell shared with them, talked about being born again. Kid got born again on the bus. Went home, told his dad. Dad was like, no, it's not right. The Mormonism and Christianity are the same. It's like, let's bring out the books then. Let's bring them out. Test them side by side. Let's see how they sink. They don't sink. They contradict. Okay, so there's been an attempt by Latter-day Saints to build a church upon a foundation that is not the Jesus of the Bible. Little pro tip. Just because it uses the name Jesus doesn't mean it's Jesus, okay? There's a lot of guys named Jesus out there. Certain cultures, you might notice that, right? Um, but they're not Jesus, okay? So we got we to gotta be true to the scripture. The Jesus of the Bible is what we want to line it up against here. Um, Matthew, uh, the story of Peter telling Jesus, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then he said, changing the names and whatnot, uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I don't think we're very fair to Peter. I think the church was built on Peter and the other apostles as well. But especially, there's a great interpretation to this, of the, the declaration of you are the Christ, the son of the living God, is the bedrock that the church is built. So no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is Jesus Christ. Um, I just found this in my old notes and I had to look it up today, but in the quadrangle of Leland Stanford University, I never knew that it was Leland Stanford, near San Francisco, there stood a magnificent memorial arch to Leland Stanford, built so largely and solidly and splendidly, it seemed it would stand forever. But when the earthquake came, it collapsed in ruin. This was the great San Francisco earthquake, early 1900s. Its foundations were disclosed after the earthquake. The builder had put in chips and rubble. And so just so tragic there. And and now you can Google the image and just see a big space uh, where that once was. Now, verse 2. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold... I remember a hilarious tiny little snip from a Saturday Night Live years ago, and it was uh, a lady dressed up like a gold salesman on a commercial, saleswoman, and she says, gold, guaranteed to almost never go down in value. That's what I think of, almost never go down in value, whenever I think of gold. So when you build with the materials, you're building materials, gold is what's used, right? Silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. These are all the different materials that you could use. 
Go on down to Habitat for Humanity and look at all the different things that you could buy for a building there. One error that I did when we remodeled our house was, you know, can lights are expensive. Head on down to the Habitat for Humanity and use the can lines that were ripped out of some other house. It was a great idea. So wonderful how then you sheetrock all around it. And then when it all breaks down, you got to tear all that out. Okay, anyways, a little bitter. Why didn't they tell me that this could be a problem? Or you could go down to your other, you know, more prestigious building supply stores and get some good materials, right? Um, now, Leon Morris says, many commentators, rest- uh, by the way, uh, we, we keep hearing the phrase, each one, anyone, and it just speaks of multiple people have these roles of farming and building, okay? Who are these each ones and any ones? Leon Morris says, many commentators restrict the application of this passage to simply the work of teachers, and it surely has a special reference to their work. But the words seem capable of more general application as verses 16 and 17 are going to refer to a wider circle. And Arthur Wallace says, every believer is a laborer. Not one of God's children who has not been redeemed for service and has not his work waiting. If we've been redeemed for service, there's a work waiting for us. And so um, if anyone builds the foundation, there's a number of building materials available. Now just think real quick, you might not be a master craftsman, but if you were to build a building, you could use gold and silver and precious stones and wood. You might want to throw in there a little hay, maybe some straw, makes a really good two by four brace if you just... Use that straw, right? Okay. Uh, Well, it says in verse 13, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of which sort it is. If anyone's work which he's built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as though through fire. So we gather by reading this that we are each building a house for the kingdom. We're building up the church of the Lord. We can use various materials in this process. Each of these materials either perishes when exposed to fire or is actually strengthened or refined in the fire. When fire is put to our structure that we built, some will just burn up in a poof of flame. Others will withstand the test, okay? Now, some efforts in our building that are wood, uh, hay, and straw uh, might be that we do works-based righteousness or self-centered working in our construction. Maybe our buildings are others-centered or humanistic with human wisdom and worldly-centered philosophies. So Charles Hodge says to mix human wisdom with God's wisdom in this work is, as the apostle says later on, like using alternate layers of straw and marble in the erection of a temple. Maybe we're self-powered in the way that we work, or we work through error rather than truth. Those will all be temporary buildings that go up in uh, flame. But buildings that withstand the test will receive a reward. Paul equates quality and right-focused work done as gold, silver, costly stones. Maybe there will be some things among the building that will kind of, you know, burn away when seen by flames, but overall will seen as a purification process. Uh, It was um, Andrew Wilson who showed that perhaps the author of the three little pigs had read this passage of the scripture when they wrote the the great little story uh, as the huffing and the puffing, you know, with your straw house, your wood house, or your brick house, one would endure and provide a place of safety, uh, correct? Now, it does say in the text, um, even if your work is burned, Many people just automatically are like, oh man, that must be the person. And they're going to hell because their work burn. But we're talking the context of people who are ministering for the kingdom here. 
His, he himself will be saved because he's still built on the foundation of Jesus. He'll be saved, but there was a whole lot that went up because he only built with temporary, lightweight, poor quality, flammable building supplies. And then there's this interesting phrase, he himself will still be saved, will still go to heaven, yet as through fire. Somebody once said, I just remember hearing it in my youth, that when they do get to heaven, they'll come through the flames and they'll be smelling like smoke, right? And uh, all the fires that we've had recently, you know, I took my new to me pickup truck out on these different fires and took supplies out and things and parked out in the midst of the, you know, helicopters were just like right there hovering around us and fighting the flame and whatnot. And uh, in my pickup, weeks later, you get in it and you're like, ah, that good old smell of wildland fire. You know, it's still in there. And it's just like, man, we might, we might make it, but we're going to be smelling like smoke. And it will be evident that the work that we did will have been through the wrong um, motives, the wrong ways, the wrong purpose, the wrong intention. And so import, it's important that we're doing these things uh, with the quality building materials of the glory of the Lord the kingdom of God being um, uplifted and furthered, uh, serving others, not elevating ourselves, etc. It um, says that the day will declare what your work is like. See verse 13. So the question is asked, what day are we speaking of? When does this testing of fire happen? It happens at what is called the Bema Seat Judgment. Okay, the Bema Seat Judgment. We read about the Bema Seat Judgment in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. It says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that we may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay, so that word judgment seat in the Greek, it's the word Bema. So have you ever heard the Bema Seat? Have you ever noticed that, um, go home, check your toilet out. Some uh, toilet seats brands are Bema. It's a Bema seat. They were Christians, that's all I have to say. Not my brand, of course, but probably your, okay. Um, And so the Bema seat speaks of the judgment that will happen before we enter into heaven. Uh, Some believe this happens about the rapture of the church period. And when we uh, receive our glorified bodies, etc., the Bema seat speaks of like an Olympic style judgment. We just had the Olympics uh, just this last summer. And so we're familiar with seeing the platform of people being judged based on their performance. So this is not salvation based, but this is a place where it's like a reward ceremony where it's seen. How did you serve the Lord for his kingdom and help building up the church in your time on earth? And man, some stellar performance as you're, you know, um, given rewards, the language speaks of, given rewards as you enter into heaven, crowns all throughout the New Testament. We see all kinds of crowns and rewards that are given by the Father in heaven, reference after reference after reference I can give you. And we do see in the throne room of heaven in Revelation, what do we do with our crowns? We use them to glorify the Lord yet again, right? Uh, so the Bema Seat judgment is a different judgment than the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. Okay, so don't get them confused. The Bema Seat is for believers. It's kind of this fiery purification, testing the work, sort of Olympic style judgment. Great white throne judgment of Revelation 20 is that of non-Christians where basically the book of life is opened up and it would be seen if their name had been written in the Lamb's book of life, if they had received the salvation of Jesus. And you know the, how that one ends. Uh, not saved as though through fire, but sent to fire. Anyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life will be sent into um, the, the fire of hell there. Okay, so uh, why don't we go ahead and have the worship team come on up? And we'll have to wait till next week to look at his temple, his sanctuary, the latter part of the chapter there. (laughs) 
And I'll uh, close out here with the Puritan Thomas Watson, who said, let me tell you, the more labor you've put forth for the kingdom of heaven, the more degrees of glory you shall have, as there are degrees of torment in hell, and we don't want to be weird about it, uh, but in the sense of, remember when he speaks condemnation to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, uh, those that would devour widows' houses, a greater judgment is put upon them. He says, uh, so of the glory in heaven, as one star differs from another in glory, so shall one saint. Though every vessel of mercy shall be full, yet one may hold more than another. And so as we, you can set your things aside, and this is great exhortation uh, to our church as we endeavor in 1 Corinthians to set aside any sort of schism within the church, any sort of factionism, or man, check out the middle school group today. It's pretty exciting. You're going to have to get a bigger conference room for these kids. The Corinthians were unhealthy and immature because of their favoritism and factionism. Something that we just want to make sure the Lord purges out of us at Prineville. We don't want to have any dealings with that. We want to be mature. We want to understand just the equality of value among all members and leaders. And as the Lord is exhorting us in this, that we also just realize there's a task for us to do. And it's not just the paid staff at Calvary Prineville. Every member ministries is what we see in the scripture. Ephesians chapter 4. Every part does their share in this building. And maybe the Lord would just speak some correction to us. Uh, it's, you know, sometimes it's noticeable when an individual is serving in the church out of a wrong heart. There's malice when they're serving. They're ticked off when they're serving. They've got a dark cloud over their head every time they're serving. You know, they're, they don't want to be a part of it, you know, and, and uh, they want to make sure they're getting the glory. And so, you know, man, it's like you can just hear the, the straw being packed into some sort of a stud beam wrapped around with rubber bands as they start to build their house. You're like, may I suggest steel eye beams you know something that'll stand the test where we're serving for the glory of the kingdom for the edification of one another in love not for temporary stuff but for eternal glory we don't want my i don't want my own name and i've been there you know it's like just remember um there's a pastor who has this just incredible social media presence. And I just, I don't know that it was jealousy, but it was starting to rub me the wrong way, you know? Like the Lord had that for him. And, uh, but if, if I started to, well now I need to build up my presence so that I can kind of compete with this guy. It's like, okay, well, wrong motive much, <laughs> you know? And so, no Lord, just whatever it needs, whatever, here's our culture, here's our people, what do we do? We did a subsplash thing. Let's talk it out. Let's work through it. I think this is going to work for us to have healthy community and keep everyone informed. And we're just growing and building and we get the sermons to people. And here's our motives behind it, Lord. And test us and test us here so we don't let anything be consumed there. But in all of our different ministries, number one, are you serving? If you're not serving here, it's time to get plugged in and start serving. Number two, why, how? What motives, what quality are you serving with? Man, glory for the kingdom. But the Lord also has something in it for you. He wants you to receive reward that's eternal as we move towards eternity. Lord, we just pray that you would work in our hearts all of these things. Check my heart, Lord, and our elders and our deacons, our staff. Why are we doing what we do? At times we get tired, we're a little grumpy got to get things done, got to do this. And just, Lord, keep us mindful of how we do the building, Lord. Will you guys stand with me? Well, let's just let the Lord work in our hearts as we close in a song. Isn't the Lord good to include us in the building process, in the planting and harvesting process, you know, and that he wants us to be involved with him and he gives 
treasure and reward for being a part of it. And he purifies our work so that when we are in the kingdom, it's, it's the only the pure stuff that's with us in heaven. So thankful for that. Just as we close here, I mentioned the two judgments and that what we talked about today is the Bema seat judgment that Christians will go through. Um, and I just encourage you today, if you're not a Christian, you don't get to look forward to that award ceremony, that purifying process. You look forward to the great white throne judgment. It's not going to be great. For you, it will be the time of God's wrath upon you as you've rejected him. Not wanting him to be your Lord, not wanting him to be your king, not wanting him to be your savior, living life your own way. The wrath of God abides on sinners who never turn to his mercy and his grace. And I just plead with you today, turn your heart over to him. Just right where you're at, just say, Lord, just forgive me for that. My whole life being like that. Be my king. Change my heart. Save me from the great white throne judgment. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I want to be a part of the Bema Seat judgment, Lord. Help me to live for your kingdom today. And if you prayed that prayer right now, you're saved, you're born again, you're regenerate, your sins are forgiven, you have the hope of heaven. It's a wonderful thing, and I'd love to help you walk the path with Jesus. So come talk to me if you just cried that out to the Lord. We're 14 minutes eating into our fellowship time, you guys. Join us in the room over here. Donuts and coffee hanging out. Get to know one another. God bless you guys. Have a great week. See you Wednesday night.